So now let's look at ways that we can solve problems involving ropes, rods, pulleys, and a special class of device called Atwood machines. So in this presentation what we'll talk about is ideal versus real ropes and pulleys and discuss the differences between them. We'll also look at a variety of interesting types of problems. Atwood machines, by the way, are a class of machines where you just have a, a pulley, as you can see up top here, a pulley, and we have one weight pulling down on one side and another weight pulling down on the other side. So that's what we call an Atwood machine. The other thing we can look at is what happens if we have a situation where we maybe have some ropes coming together and an object hanging like this, or you can see on our bridge we sort of see that situation where we have members that are connected and interconnected and how do we analyze the forces there. And finally what we'll look at here is pulley systems. As you, as you can see here these are pulleys that we use in a crane for example but they are used in many cases in real life. And we'll look at the problem solving strategies to solve each one of those types of problems. And of course the idea is we're going to use a free body diagram. We'll use the five-step process with Newton's laws. So what does it mean by having an ideal rope or an ideal pulley? For ideal ropes, we assume that they are massless, and we assume they don't stretch. They're not elastic. If this is the case, an ideal rope will be, t uh, the tension will be constant throughout as long as there's no constrictions in the rope. And what could constrict a rope is somebody pinching it or when we look at our pulley assumptions, if we have any friction in a pulley, the friction will bind up the rope and the tension on one side versus the other will vary. But if we do have an ideal situation with an ideal rope that doesn't get bound up somewhere along its path, the tension at both ends should be the same and it should be constant throughout. And the tension at either end will also be pulling forces. Each side will pull. We would like ideal pulleys to be both massless and frictionless. So we said before, if we had a rusty pulley and we tried to pull a rope over it, we're going to have to pull a lot harder on the rope to, to free up that rust and to pull the rope. So for example, if we had a, a lot of rust on our pulley right here, if we were pulling the rope this way with 100 pounds of force, out of our 100 pounds, a portion of that would be used up trying to free up this rust. And over at the other end, we might have 80 pounds of force on the opposite side here. So if we have a rusty pulley, which means we don't have a frictionless pulley, we have a differential in our tension as a result in the rope. In addition, we hope that these are massless. And the idea behind being massless or not, and we demonstrated this in class, if I have mass and I start to turn this pulley to get it from a zero speed up to some other speed, I have to overcome the inertia of that mass, its resistance to change in its motion, as I pull it forward. And in the same sense, that 100 pounds I'm going to apply, part of that would be reused and required to get that pulley up to speed. And as a result, we'd have a lower tension on the other side of the pulley. The same would be true if we actually had to slow down the system. If going from a fast speed to a slow speed, that pulley it has a significant mass to it. It will want to keep turning, and that will cause an imbalance in the tension on either side of the rope. The importance of the assumptions above is if, if we do have massless frictionless pulleys, for example, that allows us to assume that the tension of the rope is constant throughout. If you did have mass or friction added, that just means we'd have to deal with some additional forces and some additional inertial effects, and we'll learn about inertial effects of rotating objects in a later chapter. So in class, we looked at this situation. For scenario A, you have a box being pulled by a rope around a pulley. And let's assume this pulley is massless and frictionless. You could pull this, or you could maybe design a machine to pull this rope at a constant force of 20 newtons. So to the right, in scenario B, rather than having an expensive machine we have to design, or because we're a little bit lazy, we don't want to try to pull this with an exact 20 newton force for a long time, instead what we'll do is hang a 2 kilogram mass from the rope, and of course, a 2 kilogram mass, when gravity acts on it, has a force acting on it of 20 newtons. So my question is this. I'm pulling on the left side with 20 newtons of force manually, and on the right side, I'm letting gravity do it for me. So in that case, simple question here. If we allow these blocks to accelerate to the right, these two 5 kilogram blocks, which one will reach the end of the block first? And let's assume they have to travel, let's say, one meter each. 
So to solve this problem, what we start with, of course, is a free body diagram and then apply the five-step process using Newton's laws. So let's take a look at the free body diagrams for the two situations. So first of all, for scenario A, we have a five kilogram mass. And we're assuming these are, this is a frictionless problem. And we set our axes, x, y axes. And of course, we're going to start with gravity acting at 50 newtons of force. And we'll have a normal force of the table pushing back up with, with it's going to be 50 newtons as well, because that's going to be in static equilibrium. We've got a massless frictionless pulley. And we've got a rope going around it. So there's nothing binding the rope. There's no mass that we have to overcome the inertia of. So our tension throughout this rope, if we have a frictionless pulley, should be this constant throughout. And so our tension down here of 20 newtons should be propagated through the rope. And we should have a 20 newton tension here as well. In the other system, we have actually two blocks. And so let's draw a free body diagram for each. So we're going to use the same axes. Gravity acts the same on, we'll call this object one. Normal force, we've got a tension force pulling to the right. We've got the other block, which also has a force due to gravity on it. And that force is our 20 Newton pulling force. Once again, because of our pulley being massless and frictionless, there's not going to be a binding from the friction of a rusty pulley, for example. And if there's no mass, as this accelerates, we don't have to worry about accelerating that mass of that pulley. So as a result, our tension should be constant throughout. In that case, it allows us to state that FT1 and FT2 are the same. So that's the simplifications that we'll use using the rope and pulley to solve the right-hand problem. So for scenario, we already talked about the tension of 20 newtons being constant throughout. So this, this tension right here is going to be 20 newtons. And what I'll do first is I'll actually solve this problem using new numbers, and then we'll go back through and find a general solution. What we've done is we've already mapped out our free body diagram. Let's apply Newton's laws in the x and y direction. In the y direction, the block is not moving up and down, and so we're going to zero that out because it's under static equilibrium. In the x direction, the block is accelerating, so we'll leave this inertial term in here. Remember, your mass times your acceleration, that's essentially your inertia that's caused by this, our 5 kilogram block here. So I substituted on the left side my forces, and I only have one force in the x direction acting, and that's my tension force right here. In the y direction, I have two forces. I have a normal force, and I have a gravitational force. The normal force, we're using a positive because it's pointing upward, and a negative for the gravitational force because it's pointing downward according to our axis that we chose. And of course, we zeroed out the inertial effect because there is no acceleration of the object. On the right side, we can actually state then that the normal force is equal to the gravitational force. The magnitudes are the same. And on the left side, our tension is equal to mass times acceleration. So we can actually solve for AX and find that the acceleration is, is force divided by mass. Well, that's Newton's first. That's Newton's well, that's not a surprise, because this is Newton's second law. Acceleration is directly proportional to the tension force acting on it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So we can actually plug in some numbers here, and we can come up with a solution. We take the force divided by the mass, and we end up with a solution of 4 meters per second squared. All right, let's take a look at scenario B and see how that compares. This appears to be the same type of situation. We have a 20 newton force pulling down on the object right here. So that's going to be 20 newtons. And the question is, how does that force differ, if at all, from the previous situation? Well, let's look at the free body diagrams and see what happens. And remember, we have two objects here. So we're going to have to draw a free body diagram for each one of these and see how they interact. This is a special class of problems where we've got one or more objects tied to a rope and moving together. And so we're going to have to look at a special methodology for handling this type of problem, which is quite easy to do. So once again, we're going to select a direction for each one of our free body diagrams. So I'm going to pick our standard plus y axis and plus x axis to the right. And this object is going to be accelerating to the right. In the same sense, we'll pick an axis for our pulling object. And that axis will just pick their standard upward for y. And of course, this object is accelerating downward. So what strategy can we use to solve this type of problem? Well, here's what we'll do. First, we need to take a look at the assumptions behind the situation. And the key here is that we have an inelastic ideal rope 
So we're going to assume there's no mass. In addition, we'll assume that the pulleys here are ideal. So our pulley is both massless and frictionless. So our tension throughout the rope should be the same. And so what we'll do here, you'll notice I just changed out our FT1 and FT2 for an FT. Secondly, something else that's important, especially with this inelastic rope, so if we were to move our 5 kilogram box by 1 foot, as you see I'm in indicating up top, the question is what happens to the 2 kilogram mass? Well, if the 5 kilogram mass moves by 1 foot, that's because the 2 kilogram moved by 1 foot. So if the motion of the 5 kilogram box is identical to the motion of the 2 kilogram box, why are we using a variable for the acceleration here that's different than the variable for the acceleration over here. If both the accelerations are the same, we should use the same variable. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to treat the x-axis of the 5 kilogram box as the same axis as the 2 kilogram box. In other words, the rope defines our axis. We'll just bend this x-axis right around this pulley and the x-axis over here will point downward. If you look over to the right, I'm going to change all these red vectors into blue x vectors. And I'm going to take my y axis and turn it into x axis. And it's going to follow the direction of the rope. So it will be moving downward. And we'll have a downward x axis on the right hand side of our diagram for our 2 kilogram box that matches this x axis from the 5 kilogram box. So this little trick with our axis allows us to treat our acceleration for the 5 kilogram box as the same variable as our 2 kilogram box. So what's our next step? Well, the next step, we've got our free body diagrams. We've labeled all of our information. We know we need to find the tension force and the acceleration. Those are unknown. So that's the first three, three steps of the process. So the fourth step in our five-step process is to identify the relationships to, that apply. And if we have a free body diagram, you can expect that Newton's second law will apply. And so let's take a look on the right side. This is a simpler setup because we only have one dimension here to worry about. And so we're taking the sum of the forces in the x-direction equals the mass of the object times acceleration in the x-direction. You'll notice, and you'll need to be very careful about this, is that you need to use subscripts because we've got two different masses here. I'm calling this mass on the right mass 2. You also need to be very careful about your subscripts on our directional vectors. So our forces that we're counting here are in the x-direction in both the acceleration and the force. So into the left side of the equation, I'll substitute all of our forces. And we've got two forces. We've got a gravitational force pulling downward, and we've got a tension force going upward. And you notice, we've defined positive here in the x direction in the downward direction. So any vectors that are downward are positive, and any vectors that are pointed upward are negative. So we've got positive Fg2 minus Ft equals our mass times our acceleration. So now what we can do is if we want to use a numeric solution, is this is a state where you can start plugging in numbers. So I'm going to plug in a 20 newtons here for my gravitational force, and my mass for object 2 is 2 kilograms. Now you'll notice here that I'm left with two unknowns. I don't know what the tension force is. I don't know what the acceleration of the object is. And of course, those are my two unknowns I'd like to solve for in this problem. And if you get to this point, don't be frustrated. Don't get stuck saying, oh, I don't know what to do next. Just keep pushing through. You've got another object over the other side, which will yield some more equations. And so hopefully we'll be able to use a system of equations and do some substitution to get rid of one of these variables and solve for the other. So I'm going to solve for ft equals 20 minus 2ax. If I move over to the left side of my screen, I have my 5 kilogram object, which I named mass 1, as you can see. In the y direction, we're in static equilibrium. So those will zero out, and we'll get fg1 equals fn. In the x direction, we only have one force. So this is a very simple situation again. We've only got one force. We're using our axes that we established here to determine signs. And on the y equation, we can solve for fn equals fg1, which is 50 newtons. And on the x side, we can go ahead and substitute in a number now here for our mass, ft equals 5ax. So you'll notice here what we have is we've got two equations with the same two unknowns. And we can do a substitution either from left side to the right side or vice versa. So I'm going to substitute from the right side over into the left side for ft. And what I find out is that uh, 20 minus 2ax equals 5ax. And the goal now is to get all the ax's onto one side and solve for ax.
And what I've done is I've factored out the AX. And that shows us that we've got our force acting on the object is 20 newtons by this object that's pulling down. And then we have to move not 5 kilograms with this, but 7 kilograms that's related to our acceleration. So when we calculate and solve for AX, we find out that our force here is not 20 divided by 5, but 20 divided by 5 plus 2, which is 2.86 meters per second squared. That's much lower than the 4 meters per second squared we saw in the last problem. And the reason is, in the last problem, we divided 20 by 5 kilograms. In this case, the difference is we're not moving a 5 kilogram mass anymore. We need to move both a 5 and a 2 kilogram mass. So our inertia for the system has changed. It's gone up by quite a bit. And of course, if our inertia is increased, our acceleration, given the same forces acting on an object, will be lower. What about FT? Now we can take our 2.86 meters per second squared and plug it into the equation above. And we find out that our tension in the rope is not 20 newtons, as it turns out. It's only 14.3 newtons. So let's take a look at the same situation as a general solution. Our assumptions, of course, still hold from before. We've got a massless friction this pulley, which is going to allow our tension to be the same in, in the rope throughout. So this tension and the tension over here are identical. The next step, of course, is the axis follows the rope. So we're choosing plus x along this direction with the rope. And when the rope turns a corner, we have plus x down in this direction. And that ties our left and right sides together. So we're applying Newton's laws just what we did before. I've already talked about the signs. We've decided downward is positive, and so we have positive forces downward. Negative forces are upward. Equals mass times acceleration. We can go ahead and plug in for Fg is Mg. Please keep an eye on your subscripts. Don't lose any subscripts. And we'll solve for Ft. For the other side of the problem, once again, we're in equilibrium in the y direction. So in the y direction, we have Fn equals Fg1. In the x direction, very simple situation. We just have one force, our tension force. It's in the positive direction, as you can see here. And it equals mass times acceleration. And the next step will be to do our substitution. I'm going to plug M2G minus M2AX into my left equation. And now the question is, how would you solve this mathematically? The idea is to bring all of your unknowns. And our unknown here is AX. We know our mass. We know gravity. We know our other mass, and we know our initial mass as well. And the only unknown we have is acceleration. And so what we'd like to do is collect these terms over to the right side of the equation. And then after I collected these terms over, I actually factored out the AX. And then I can divide out the M1 plus M2 factor on the right side. And here's my new solution. I can plug in my numbers to check it. And sure enough, it matches my last page. If we compare the results, the free body diagrams for the 5 kilogram mass look very similar. But you'll notice what's different is the tension in the rope is quite a bit lower for this right side. By the way, this is called a half Atwood machine. Um, a full Atwood is just when both objects are hanging down on one side or the other. And you can see here, because of this difference, if we looked at our general solution results, this is just Newton's law here. Acceleration is our force divided by our mass. Here is our force. Here is our mass. And we got a simple solution of 4 meters per second squared. If you look at uh, the second situation, acceleration equals force divided by the mass as well. But you just got to remember, we have two masses here, not one. So both of these masses must be accelerated. And with more mass, you have more inertia, which means you're going to have a lower acceleration. If you take our Fg2 and break it out as mass 2 times gravity, you can rewrite this equation as so. And you have a nice little simple relationship relating our acceleration in the x direction as a fraction of gravity. So what happens if we add friction here? Well, if we add friction, it's really not hard to add friction in here. All you have to do is add one more force into your previous work, and you'll see how easy that is to do. So for the simple case, I'm just adding once again one more force. And if you flip through your work, here's the change right here. Before we had uh, tension force only. And now we're just adding in a second force here, friction. And so we replace that with mu kfn. 
and for fn, here's our standard substitution that we do when we have an fn in a situation. We're going to substitute fn equals m times g over into the other side. And when we get our final result, we have minus mu kmg plus ft over m. And this is nothing new. This is your sum of your forces divided by your mass. All right, our force, two forces being due to friction and due to tension, and our mass being the mass of the single object. In the same sense, for this situation, we just have our new frictional force in only on, uh, affecting the 5 kilogram object related to this surface friction here. And once again, you'll just have your frictional force coming through your equations, and you'll do your substitution between Fn and Fg right there. And you just picked up a new term in your final solution right here. And here's a summary of the results. So let's take a step back and review some techniques that we can use for problems with ropes and pulleys. This is a very important summary, and you want to study this for your next quiz. First of all, we have to understand the implications when we have ropes and pulleys in a problem. Hopefully they're ideal ropes and pulleys that have no mass, because if we add mass to the situation, that means we're going to have to accelerate that mass as well as any other mass in the system, and we're going to have to apply more force in order to do so to have the same type of acceleration. For pulleys, we need to make sure that the pulleys are frictionless, otherwise they'll bind up our rope and we'll have to take into account how to overcome that friction in the pulley. If we have more than one object connected by a rope, and perhaps the rope is redirected by a pulley into different directions, all we need to do to solve this type of problem is start by drawing a free body diagram for each object. And then, if the objects move in unison, if it's a non-elastic rope, then the objects will move in unison and they accelerate at the same rate. And so what we can do is treat the x-axis as a common x-axis for both of the objects. It just bends around corners. That's all you've got to do. Another class of problems is if you were to have two or more ropes tied together, or if you were to have instead of ropes, maybe solid bars or something like this formatted in this figure like we saw trusses before on the Tingsboro Bridge. So the trick you can use here to simplify this problem is to take this point where all of the ropes combine and we'll put a free body diagram right on that point. And now what we can do is we can draw forces acting on that object and in this case there will be three forces and you can map out those forces and apply Newton's laws, decompose your vectors, and see what happens. Pulleys, and this is a block and tackle pulley you see here, are very similar in that we have the spot where all these ropes are converging and we have something down below. And so the key to solving a problem like this would be to take your free body diagram and use your pulley as your free body diagram. So draw a free body diagram for the pulley off to the side and what you'll end up with is, is a force acting downward, and then you'll have four ropes acting upward. And then, hopefully, you can make some nice assumptions about the ropes, like we talked about above. If we have ropes and pulleys that act the way we'd like them to, and you can easily solve those types of problems. So here are some other applications of situations where objects come together and meet up at points. For example, we've got four trust members joining to one point. And once again, what we do is we draw a free body diagram at that one point, and we can analyze that. So here, for example, we have a Pratt truss, and it has 15 structural members. I'm counting each one of these members here and each one of these along the top and the bottom. So what if we wanted to know what the amount of tension or compression was in each one of these members? Of course, that means there are 15 unknowns in this problem, and we'd have to come up with enough information to solve for 15 variables. It sounds challenging, but what we do is the following. First, we draw a free body diagram over each joint, but we're going to assume, for argument's sake, that all the forces are in tension rather than compression. It turns out, if that internal force is actually compression rather than tension, that just means our sign is going to be negative. So what we do is we take a look at these several free body diagrams. And of course for each free body diagram we have a, an equation that summar, sums up the forces in the x direction and the y direction. And we have nine free body diagrams here, so nine times two equations each gives us 18 equations for only 15 unknowns. And we can actually go through and solve a really big system of equations. 
And there are simpler ways to do this, and there's ways to, to cut these problems down. But that's a, a quick methodology we can use to do this. Of course, to find a solution, what will we do? We'll draw a free body diagram for each one of the masses, and we'll use that recommended procedure we saw in the half atwood situation. So for each one, we're going to draw a free body diagram. I'll start with the capital M block, and you'll notice instead of using subscripts, I'm actually using capital versus small letters, which is another method that's possible here. Some people like using uh, capital small letters. Other people would prefer using M1, M2, six of one half dozen of another. So I'm going to assume that M is larger, so the object M will be moving downward. So I'll take that as my preferred direction, as downward plus Y is in the downward direction. For object, for the second object, the small M, that one, of course, will accelerate upward. And of course, if these are ideal ropes and ideal pulleys, we have no friction, we have no mass in the pulley, no mass in the rope. We'd expect a tension to remain constant throughout, and we'd expect these objects to move together if the rope's not elastic. And so if the rope so in other words, if object M moves down exactly one foot, then the small M box will move exactly up one foot. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our rule for a rope. We're going to follow the rope. If this side is moving down, that side is moving up, and we're going to call that our plus y axis. All right, so we'll let the axis follow the direction of the rope. That's how you, that is the secret to solving these problems. Very simple. So I'll just apply Newton's laws on both of these. I'll add them to my forces. I've got a gravitational force pulling down on each block. And I've got a tension force pulling up on each block. And of course, we've already stated the assumption that these are ideal pulleys and ideal ropes and the tension should be constant throughout if there's no binding on the rope or if there's no inertia of the pulley that I have to overcome on one side of the rope or another. And we'll apply the second law for both cases and so we'll just uh, substitute in on the left side for each equation the sum of the forces. Be very careful about your signs. On this left block downward is positive, on the right block upward is positive. So on the left block, our gravitational pull is a positive, And on the upward tension force, that's actually negative. And that equals our mass of that block times its acceleration. On the right situation, what we have is the gravitational force is actually downward in the negative direction. And positive for the tension force equals MAY. And we'll do a substitution for gravity equals mass times gravity for both of these. You have to be very careful with your capital and small m's. And what we end up with is two equations and two unknowns. Our, our unknowns are Ay and Ft, just as we saw with the half atwood situation. So what I'll do is I'll solve one of these equations for Ft and substitute in the other. And so on the right side, I'm solving that for Ft, and I'll substitute that into the left side of my equation. There's my substitution then to make. Make that substitution in parentheses. You will notice, here's the reason why I always do that. There's a negative sign here. You've got to distribute that negative into both of these terms. So if you did not put those parentheses there, chances are you would not do this step properly. I'm going to bring over these results to the next page. So here we're, here's where we left off. Now the next thing I'll do is I'll distribute this negative into my equation. I'll distribute this <clears throat> so the next thing I'll do is I'll So here's the same equation we had on the last page. 
And the first thing I'll do is I'll distribute the negative sign into my parentheses. And then, because here's my unknown, AY on the left and right side, I'll collect all of my terms with AY onto the right side. And then I'll factor out my common factor, AY. And now I can just to solve for AY, just divide both sides by capital M plus little m. And this is my nice simple relationship. And it looks similar to what we saw before with the half atwood. And the question is, why bother finding a set general solution? Well, we can see this is a nice simple solution here. And it tells us our acceleration is, is a proportionally related to g, based on this proportion of our the difference of our masses over the sum of the masses. The larger the overall mass, the, the less our acceleration be. But then we have to So why find a general solution? Well, the general solution just lets us easily see that our acceleration is directly proportional to gravity. So why find a general solution? Well, the ge general solution allows us to see that our acceleration in the y direction is directly proportional to gravity. And here's our constant of proportionality. We've got a simple ratio of the difference of our masses over the sum of the masses. That allows us to answer some simple questions like this. What happens if the two masses are equal? Well, if the two masses are equal, our 2m's up top subtract, and that zeroes out this fraction. And so we get our acceleration is 0, which we'd expect. And that means we're in equilibrium. Remember, we can have two types of equilibrium here. That could be dynamic or static equilibrium, which means either these two objects will be sitting still, like you just see it here, or if I gave one of these objects a little push or a pull, that would mean that these objects would start moving, and they would move at a constant speed after that point in time, if there is no friction, at least impending. Assuming there is no friction slowing down our motion. What happens if the big mass is much, much larger than the small mass? Well, we can use dominant term analysis that you learned in pre-calculus. And what we'd end up with, let's say our big mass is 1,000 kilograms and our small mass is. So let's, assume, so let's assume, for example, that our big mass is 1,000 grams and our small mass is 10 grams. What we'd end up with is 990 over 1,010. And of course, that's just a little bit under 1. And so we'd have an acceleration to gravity that's about 0.99 or so of gravity. And so we can use dominant terminal analysis like that. And we can also take a look at these nice situations. What, happen if, what happens if our big mass is exactly twice the value of our small mass? And it's very easy to work out solutions like that just by plugging those numbers in. We can also compare to our half atwood situation. And you can see the similar, this, and you can see this and you can see the similarity between the two formulas. We have a ratio again. In the, bo in the bottom, we have our sum of our masses. And up on top, we have a little bit of difference in these two situations. Now, I'm not recommending that you would ever memorize these general solutions we're coming up with, because we're going to find general solutions for probably 100 different things in this course. All you need to know here to solve this is the techniques that we're using, the five-step process, and using free body diagrams. And you can come up with this in five minutes or less. So let's take a moment to look at some different types of pulleys. And we'll demonstrate this in class as well. So as you can see, we've got two general types of pulleys. Some are fixed. If I were to pull on this rope, the pulley doesn't move up and down at all, but the weight does. Whereas in this case, if I were to pull up on the rope, this pulley would move up as well as the weight. So we've got a fixed pulley versus a movable pulley. These pulleys can also be doubled up in various ways. So you can see these are actually on the same axle, and they're doubled up, which we call coaxial, or they're parallel to each other. So we've got two in a parallel 
situation. But we can also double them up in this situation, or triple them in tandem, we call this. And the question is, does it make a difference if we use doubled up in parallel or in tandem? And it turns out it's the same thing. So here's an example of a doubled up situation and a tandem situation. And it turns out, if you work out the physics of this, the identity does two. And it turns out, if you analyze the physics of the situation, the two situations are identical. And as you can see, here are just a few configurations you can come up with with single, double, and triple pulleys of various types. And you can imagine there's many more situations that you can come up with this. And you could only imagine that there are many, many more other combinations you can come up with. And as you'll see, there are some special names for a number of these situations as well that relate to naval history and shipping and things like that. So your job is going to be to apply the principles that we talked about in our general slide that we had before. How do you solve a problem like this? And the key is to focus on the pulley. Um, I can take this pulley right here, and I'm going to draw a free body diagram for it. All right, And this is a massless pulley, so our mass is going to be zero. And we can draw the amount of forces on this. We've got a weight pulling down. And actually, I can draw a free body diagram for this weight, too. And here's the free body diagram for the weight. We've got our tension force pulling downward. So we've got our gravitational force pulling downward. And we've got the tension in this buckle that's connecting it together, pulling upward. And let's assume on all these problems that these are going to be in equilibrium, which means these two forces have to be equal opposite. And this same tension force here must be the tension that's pulling down on our pulley. Remember, this FBD is for the pulley. And so that's the same tension, FT, which if, let's say, for example, it's 100 pounds. So pardon my sloppy writing here with my mouse. But let's assume if we have 100 pounds in equilibrium on the mass down below, then we would have a 100-pound uh, force acting downward on our pulley. And then on our pulley, what do we have? We have two ropes acting upward. So one, two, pulling upward on this. And then I'll let you finish the rest of the problem from there. One question to ask yourself, if we're trying to figure out the tension in the pulley, the force on the ceiling, and the force that we're pulling this with. And we have this in equilibrium, which means either we're pulling with a constant velocity or we're stopped and just holding it still. My question is, does the angle matter here? In question 15, similar, very similar situation, but we have an angle in here. And the question, once again, does this, is this any different from our last problem? So now we have a fixed pulley put in a different situation. So once again, my recommendation is you put a free body diagram around each one of these and see what happens. And here's our single movable pulley. Once again, what you're going to do is create a free body diagram around the pulley. On question 18, this is called a gun tackle. We're getting into blocks and tackles now. And are these two situations equivalent? So I can actually draw a free body diagram around this pulley on the left. And in the same sense, I can draw a free body diagram of that pulley. I can also draw a free body diagram over here if I need, and around here if I need, and go ahead and draw those off to the side, draw your forces on them, and see how everything works out. 
don't forget your important assumptions that you're making about pulleys and ropes to solve these problems. And lastly, I have what's called a double tackle. You'll notice I have a, a double pulley up top, double pulley on bottom. These are t a tandem version on the right. And so perhaps what you could do is look at this or this as your free body diagram for each situation and see what happens. And of course, I have the answer over here. Don't look at that answer. And some of you may have already known this, but these pulleys are called simple machines. Um, a lever, cavemen, you could imagine, have the lever. A caveman could actually have a little inclined plane. I'm not sure about that nice wagon. Um, a, a caveman, you could imagine having a wedge and using it. Um, I don't know. These ones, I would say, are simple for cavemen. Are these three down below really that simple? I don't know. That's just an observation. We've done this situation before already. We haven't looked at it as a simple machine, but we'll talk more about that later. But we'll actually play with this in class to see why this is a simple machine and why this makes it easier for us to get work done. In the same sense, we could do it for all these other machines.